I'm here to rip apart your assumptions about money. I'm going to show you that behind the financial crisis and the environmental crisis lies a hidden crisis in our monetary system, the very way our money is created. And I'm also going to show you that there's this community of people growing around the world that are using the latest technologies to create new currencies that will serve us and not the banks. And I'm going to call for media old and new to tell these new stories of money. Now, although we use money every day, uh, often many of us don't really know the first thing about it in terms of how it's created and how that affects us. So what I'd like to do is do a little thought experiment with you. I'd like you to imagine that you're living in a village way back in time, let's say 3,000 years ago. Some of you bake bread, some of you look after chickens, some of you uh, fix clothes, and so you all swap stuff amongst yourselves. It's a barter economy. But then one day, a knight comes to your village, and he looks at what you're doing, and he says, well, why don't you use my tokens? It'll be so much easier for you. You can swap them. So you decide to give it a go, and he lends each of you 10 tokens. Uh, and so you start using these, and you find it's great. You no longer have to swap your bread for eggs. You don't have to remember who owes who what. You can just swap the tokens. So you find suddenly you have a lot more free, free time. It's great for you. So you ask the knight to keep the tokens, and he agrees on one condition, that at the end of the year, when he returns, he can see that you've got 11 tokens. Otherwise, you will forfeit uh, your assets to him. Now, because they've become so useful to you, you s agree and you'll, you'll try this out. So time goes by and everything's fine, but then you realize the knight is returning soon, so you start to ask more for your bread. You start to ask more to fix people's clothes. And you realize, actually, that your neighbors have done the same thing. So suddenly, there's a lot less tokens circulating in your village. The knight returns, and not everyone has 11 tokens. It's impossible. And so some of you lose your homes, lose your farms. In this situation, might this technology of tokens meant that you changed the way you relate and what you value and how you even feel? Do you think in this situation you might come to see the tokens as the wealth and not yourself, your neighbors, your village, or your environment? Fast forward 3,000 years, and our money system today is quite like that. Just now it's on cocaine. Literally, if some reports are to be believed. <laughs> now, this is not to be joked about. It is so important to whatever you're working on. We have to really address these issues. I've worked for 16 years helping large companies, UN agencies, and charities team up to address global challenges like climate change, overfishing, uh, forced labor, HIV AIDS. And we've created some cool coalitions that are changing business practices worldwide. But some of us have come to realize that if we want to change business in really widespread and lasting ways, to, if we want to change the way business does business, we must now change the way money makes money. Now, unfortunately, there aren't many people funding work in this area, <laughs> as I found out. So I, I, to work on it more, I had to outsource myself uh, to India. So I ended up working with uh, an, an NGO called Community Forge, and they create free open source software for communities to run their own currencies. And through working with them, I had my eyes open to this whole world of innovation in complementary currencies, where some of them using units of hours worked, some of them even looking at using kilowatt hours as the measurement, some pegged to a national currency. And I also realized that advances in social networks and mobile payment systems means we're on the verge of a revolution in the scale and uptake and use of such currencies. Soon you will be able to work, walk into your local store, ask for the bill in, in a local currency, and pay with your mobile phone through an SMS or, or near-field communication or the web. Just yesterday in Brixton in London, they launched just such a scheme. So I'll return to this issue of innovation in this field later. But I think one of the most important things I got from beginning to work on this is I realized I, like many people, have so many completely unfounded assumptions 
about what money is. Someone asked me the simplest of questions. Where does money come from? Where does money come from? Now, I'm a professor of, of management, not economics, but you know, I like to think I know things, and it's a very simple question, and I didn't have a clue. I offered the idea that, well, doesn't government create it? And then I found out, well, yes, 3% of all money is created by governments in the mint, so these are the coins and the notes we have. But the rest, in nearly all countries of the world, the rest is 97% is made by banks, private banks. It's electronic. And they create this with interest, of course. So when you, went to, when you go to a bank, did you think that the bank had the money to lend you when you borrow it? I did. But no, they create it out of nothing. And of course, as I say, they create it with interest. And, but they don't create the interest. So who creates the interest? It's created with another loan with more interest. So it means today there is more debt in the world than money. Just like with the knight and his tokens, we can't pay off the debts. There's just not enough money. Individually, we might. But collectively, we're in debt forever. We're paying compound interest forever. Now, this creates a lot of problems. But for time, I'll mention just two. The first is this system of money creation as debt with interest means that increasing economic inequality, differences between rich and poor, is a mathematical certainty. No wonder then that 2% of people in the world now control half, or more than half now, of the world's wealth. The second problem is environmental. Because we need more and more lending to catch up because of all the interest, we must have more and more products and services traded, and therefore we must have more consumption of natural resources. Otherwise, the system will collapse and we'll have defaults, recession, and so on. Now, we don't have an exponentially expanding planet, as far as I'm aware, and so this money system means that for all our ingenuity, all we're doing is delaying the ultimate crash that's being pre-programmed by this stupid money system. So that's the theory. But how does this really feel? How, who's got some money? I've, I, I brought along um, 20 euros. Let me see your money. Show me your money. I want to see some money. Now, we, we know this is just paper, don't we? We know this is paper. As paper, it's not that useful to us. You can, you can scribble on it, maybe, or... Um, write a prayer, put it under your pillow and pray. But it's just, just paper. We choose to make it worth something more than that, because that's helpful for us, for, for us. But we would be a delusion to think it has value in itself. It's just paper. It's just money. Yeah? We are the wealth. Us. Our ability and our desire to do things for each other. It would be a delusion to think this is wealth. And if we run our society as if this is wealth, haven't we gone completely mad? Yet you turn on the telly, as I think many of you do, and what do you see? You just see everyone talking about growth. We need more growth to restore growth. So I used to think anyone talking like this was a nutter. And maybe you can relate to that now. And I think it was my my desire to be relevant and my fear of being ridiculed that held me back from working on these critical issues. And I've realized that the mass media, many of you guys, helped to define what's considered relevant or ridiculous. So you have a key responsibility to encourage effective debate about the real causes of all these crises we're seeing. So I looked online for a quick check, and I found that there are about 42 million web pages mention financial crisis. So guess how many of those also mention monetary reform? Just over a hundred and so thousand, so about 0.3%. It's almost as if there's a taboo about talking about the real causes for our current problems. So what if media embraced its responsibility to challenge our assumptions, to dig a bit deeper? And what if t journalists asked our top politicians the simplest of questions, where does money come from? You might get some funny answers. It might make for some amusing television. Fortunately, we do have the world of new media, as we've been hearing about, and this is allowing 
uh, independent voices to reach audiences of millions worldwide. So homemade films like Money as Debt have been watched over a million times on YouTube. And social networks means that currency innovators and campaigners for monetary reform can share what they're doing and learn from each other. There's one initiative I'm engaged in, it's called the Finance Innovation Lab in the UK, and through that we're learning about all these different initiatives and innovations. Now clearly we need, we need to work out how to deal with this problem of banks creating money from nothing at interest, but I'm not holding my breath that we're gonna, on that one and we're going to see much leadership on that. So what I am doing is engaging with people who are creating new currencies. And I've realized that there are now hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, from slums of Rio and Nairobi to business hubs in Bristol and Brussels, people creating and using their own currencies. If you're interested, you can look online for, say, Time Banks in the US, Let's in the UK, Regio Geld in Germany, the Weir in Switzerland. You could look up Bitcoin, an entirely digital currency that's become huge in just a year. You could look at collaborative consumption websites, which help neighbors share stuff. Not such a, a new idea. And they're now looking at creating currencies so people don't have to pay. You have other ways of just um, swapping things. So you don't have to have money in order to be helpful to your community. But all these innovations mean we need a clearer idea about what kind of currencies will be good for us, not harm us. So it doesn't mean going back to scarce metal as our money. It doesn't mean waiting for Facebook to come up with the new global private currency, as I'm sure they will one day. We need to be clearer about what kind of money is going to serve us. And I think that must be money that's issued as a public utility, and it's not issued for private profit. The current money system, as I've described, has been ripping apart our planet, is now even tearing apart our communities. Maybe when you look at the news in the last week, it's even ripping itself to pieces. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are people now that I'm working with who are creating currencies that weave together communities, not tear them apart. So we don't need to kneel to the banks. We can stand for what we really value in each other, and we can start by losing our delusions about money, working for real reform, trying real alternatives, and telling a whole new story about money and ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.